Well, thanks for the warm introduction and reception this morning. It's so great to be with many of you uh, live in person. And, uh, you know, like most Zoom calls, you can't really tell the reaction uh, online. So hopefully there's some value uh, with the folks online as well. <clears throat> um, as noted, I'm a former Army Ranger. Uh, I enlisted in the Army after high school, and I was in Germany when... <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. I'm, I'm from Ohio, so that's about as good of a shared Brown impersonation as I can do. Um, but so uh, a after high school, I enlisted in the, in the infantry, and I was sent over to Germany. And at that time, the Berlin Wall was up, and uh, I was there at the time that it came down. And when the wall came down, essentially our post-World War II consensus uh, came down as well. So that time in Germany put me on a road less traveled to West Point. I went uh, from active duty to West Point, so not uh, from high school, the normal route. Uh, so when I went there, uh, I studied history, studied uh, mechanical engineering, and uh, I returned to active duty as an infantry officer. I led in great units, uh, including the Old Guard, the 75th Ranger Regiment, and the 101st Airborne. So uh, I left the Army in 2000. So. I missed the war on terror, at least the active uh, combat portion. Uh, at the time, I was frustrated with the lack of a, really an American grand strategy, a unifying vision to create a post-Cold War consensus. Uh, the consequences for that lack of consensus showed up in disparate missions, uh, whether you're talking uh, how did we deal with, with uh, the first Iraq war, how did we deal with uh, Somalia, did, did we do anything about uh, some of the disruptions all over? We certainly went into Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, and we had inadequate training. Uh, when I got to the 101st Airborne Division, all the helicopters were parked, uh, including for the units that were gonna go deploy to Kosovo. So they were, they were literally told to ride on trucks and pretend they're on helicopters. They were given lack of ammunition. You couldn't get uh, lensatic compasses. So this was for the 101st Airborne Division, the unit that was going to go deploy to combat in Kosovo. So uh, they weren't funded. And you had bad funding priorities. At the time, Trent Lott was the Senate Majority Leader. <clears throat> and uh, they were getting ships built in Mississippi that the Navy said they didn't need, but they were really good for Mississippi. And I could run down the list of, uh, of things that were going on there on funding priorities. So a lot of things haven't really changed that much in some ways. But um, there was a menacing void when I resigned from the Army, and it was filled with a horrible ideology that has left America less free, less safe, and more burdened by debt. I call this horrible ideology the neoconservative consensus. Uh, it's characterized by a, <clears throat> by a postulate that more wars in more places will somehow make America more secure. It's reinforced by a surveillance state that collects intelligence on American citizens at an alarming rate, and it's anchored by a commitment to massive fiscal deficits. Endless wars require endless funding, after all. Lastly, it has been enabled by an exceptionally passive Congress, derelict of its duty. Um, it's effectively ceded its constitutional obligations on war powers. Nations go to wars, not just armies, and Congress has a moral and constitutional obligation to declare our nation's wars. Fundamentally, when we send our young men and women, <clears throat> when we send our young men and women into combat, uh, we ask them to kill, uh, we put, ask them to put their own lives at risk, we ask them to take other lives, and to, they're scarred and deal with the consequences of this. Congress should at least be asked to vote. But this persists for a long time. So let me break down some of the pieces. Less free, uh, we look inside our own country and our civil liberties are protected by our Constitution, uh, granted by God, but defended by our government when it's rightly constructed. And the Fourth Amendment does not have an asterisk beside it that says, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Uh, it, it says that you have a right to privacy, and you should expect a warrant if there's a probable cause, there's due process. Well, the safeguards are there, but the surveillance state that's been constructed is pretty comprehensive. Frankly, the Patriot Act uh, built upon FISA. FISA 
it has a bad name right now, but it was really passed in the 70s to try to rein in um, you know, the intelligence apparatus that felt like they had an unlimited ability to collect data to surveil Americans, and it was meant as a check on that authority. That was blown wide open with the Patriot Act. Uh, of course, we also have the Bank Secrecy Act, uh, which basically says if you have money on deposit anywhere in America, your financial transactions aren't private. Uh, the banks can operate as long as they spy on you effectively. Um, you have new mandates that are in the works, like the Corporate Transparency Act, where if you think that you could own a corporation with some modicum of privacy, um, that's not true. If you don't turn in um, the ownership structure of a company, they want to put you in jail. Thankfully, this one hasn't passed, but they did couple it with the NDAA last year, which is part of why I voted against last year's NDAA. Um, which is hard to do, uh, given the background. Uh, they use business records <clears throat> to say that if you say, I don't know, have a, a business account with, say, somebody that provides email or cell phone service or things like that, um, that everything about that is no longer private. You have no expectation of privacy because you shared it with someone. So they subpoena that with no, no, uh, no real due process there. Um, and <clears throat> you could go on and on, but, uh, but less free, I think, is safe to say. Um, while you know, I'm not a, not a huge fan of Edward Snowden's uh, decisions, uh, it, and they had bad consequences, I think he obviously made public uh, some things that a lot of people suspected, many people knew, uh, but now there's no doubt uh, that these things are in the public light. Uh, we're less safe. So they're like, how is it that we're less safe because of the neocon consensus? And <clears throat> basically, if you have 100 priorities, you don't have priorities. Uh, we, <clears throat> we have spent an enormous amount of resources um, fighting endless wars, and uh, the, they've overwhelmingly gone to Central Command. So Central Command fights these wars in the Middle East, <clears throat> and our only threats are not in the Middle East. Um, it's, it's led to uh, a, a weakening of the other command structures in our defense apparatus. And it's a halted modernization. And we'll see uh, the implications on that, whether it's the space race, the reaction to China developing the capabilities that they've developed, uh, the reaction to, to non-terror-based uh, threats to the United States. We've been caught flat-footed in numerous scenarios, and we've been slow to react to the economic aspects of our national security outside of uh, Middle East-based uh, natural resources. We're clearly more burdened by debt. It turns out that uh, endless wars are very expensive. Uh, we spent more than $6 trillion just in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we're continuing uh, 19 years and counting in Afghanistan and uh, rebuilding a lot of infrastructure over there. Uh, and you see people clinging to the status quo. Uh, they, uh, really the neoconservatives, are the other resistance movement opposing President Trump's objectives. So you see that show up in things like, hey, how about if we move 10,000 troops out of Germany? Uh, they literally moved a, a Crow-Cheney amendment to try to oppose uh, Donald Trump simply moving 10,000 troops out of Germany. Somehow Germany's less, uh, you know, less safe by the 10,000 Americans there. We're only down to 25,000 if we do that. Um, you could see it with, uh, you know, opposition to or, or urging to get in involved with uh, Turkey when they wanted to, uh, you know, interact with the people that are doing the cross-border incursions into Turkey uh, with the Kurds. So uh, an ongoing resistance movement, and frankly, if you look at the Lincoln Project, they're, they're disproportionately made up of, of uh, the neocons. Uh, no one more iconic than Bill Kristol. Uh, so it's one thing to offer an indictment of the horrible consensus, um, horrible neocon consensus that has really left America less free, less safe, and more burdened by debt. Uh, but it's another to, to uh, lay out something better. So in my view, President Trump has laid some of the groundwork. He, he coined a phrase, drain the swamp. And Dwight Eisenhower warned us about these people in his farewell address. Not just the military industrial complex, but the scientific technical elite. So if you haven't read uh, Eisenhower's farewell address, or it's been a while since you read it, it's worth rereading. This year has really brought to light 
a lot of the things that he cautioned about. But today, the neocon swamp calls of many of us uh, here who would be interested in this sort of a, a, a gathering uh, isolationists. And to be fair, there are some who would probably wear that label proudly. But Dwight Eisenhower wasn't an isolationist. I'm not an isolationist. I do like Ike. And I think we need to look at the, the logic of um, America's traditional uh, foreign policy. Think about the implications and just look at the results. This is the pragmatic uh, reality of realpolitik. Uh, think about the people that are involved. If you want to drain the swamp, you can't really hire the swamp. And that's been one of the things that has hindered the president's objective. I think his instincts have been great, uh, but a lot of times the staffing has been, well, how, how is it that you would hire John Bolton as an example, maybe the most iconic example, to be your national security advisor? I guess it at least gives you an insight into what he's thinking. Um, but you, you, you really do have to look through our structures. If you want to get to a different consensus, you have to change the people in key roles in the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, State, Treasury, and the intelligence community. And I think the president did a lot of that in the intel community um, with, uh, with Richard Grinnell uh, to kickstart some initiative. And I'm hopeful that uh, Director Ratcliffe will, will build on that momentum. But it's also relevant in House and Senate committees. Um, you know, it, Liz Cheney's the conference chair as a Republican. Uh, certainly an iconic person in the neocon consensus. Um, and you need to look at the structures inside, inside our institutions. So whether it's training, doctrine, schools, uh, institutions that reinforce the existing consensus. So just as an example, um, during the war on terror, the combating terrorism center is co-located with the United States Military Academy. So, uh, you know, great place to put it. You get great thinkers, you get them exposed there. Uh, so the logic of it was great, but the challenge is now, are they actually fighting the battles that we're actually in instead of the ones that they were planning to be in or the ones that they hoped to be in or whatever? Are we really looking at the strategic landscape? And unless there's a difference, um, you know, an outside force acting on this uh, object, the inertia of the uh, status quo thinking is powerful. And then I think the other thing is the president coined the phrase, you know, America first foreign policy, uh, which is, you know, grounded in realism. Just what is the priority for America? Is this truly in America's national interest? And as I say, I don't think its vision was fully developed, partially because, uh, you know, the president hired the swamp to implement the vision in some cases. Uh, but let's look at how effective that was with ISIS. So when the president first came in, uh, you know, the, the, the line in the sand in Syria had been crossed. ISIS developed uh, heavily after the vacuum left when the United States exited Iraq the way they did. And uh, the, the Obama administration had been fairly ineffective at dealing with ISIS. Uh, in fact, they were, we were funding with the CIA uh, moderate Muslim rebels uh, that were fighting the moderate, moderate Muslim rebels uh, funded by the Department of Defense. Uh, and, and so this is like, you know, a problem. Uh, it's not a well-coordinated path. And uh, it, we were having a hard time deciding as a country whether we were really going to go for regime change in Syria or we were actually going to deal with the threat to, uh, of ISIS. So when the president came in, they controlled a piece of territory uh, you know, roughly the size of Ohio. Today they control zero territory. So I love the story of the guidance. Someone was telling me about the early briefings with the president and they said, you know, Mr. President, uh, what's your guidance for how he's, my guidance, go win. You guys are the generals, that's it. You know, no like brief this, check that, check this target, like defeat ISIS, that's the guidance. And so they did, you know, very effectively with economy of force. Uh, we didn't deploy much to the neocons' consternation. Giant armored divisions and peacekeeping troops and infrastructure teams and community redevelopment organizations and everything else. Uh, we simply focused on the terror groups. Uh, we built coalitions, maybe not with all the best people in the world. Uh, some of the, the, the issues when we were dealing with the Kurds, the Kurdish rebels in the, in the north that were running into problems with Turkey. I was talking with one of my friends who was a former Navy SEAL, 
and he had been uh, involved in that region in combat, and I asked him what his thoughts were. And he said, you know, we like the Irish people. The Irish people are really good. We generally don't like the IRA, though. And so this is like the, the PKK and some of the groups there were essentially uh, the terror equivalent, uh, and they were engaged in acts of terror inside Turkey, which, uh, you know, in, in some cases would rightly provoke uh, Turkey. Uh, there are other issues there. That's not our battle to fight broadly, I think, and, uh, and that's, that's the piece. So one of the honors of this job, I, I penned an op-ed at that time, defending the president's decision to move our troops out of the way and to not get involved in a broader conflict there. And uh, the president signed it, sent me a note, and called me uh, this time, a little earlier this time last year, uh, to thank me for the op-ed and the vote on the floor and, uh, and, and to share that I would be happy about the news. Well, the very next day, the news that he couldn't share on a non-secure line was that the Kurds had reached a deal with the Turks on how to de-escalate that situation. So we allowed diplomacy to work and we put the pressure on it. And so I think the president's instinct there is great and it's been effective. ISIS has been defeated, they've been checked. Uh, it won't require zero energy going forward, but it won't require 12,000 troops for, for 19 or 20 years uh, to contrast the, the approach. So what lies ahead? Well, if President Trump somehow prevails in this mangled process that we're seeing unfold, um, you know, we'll, we'll likely stay the course, and I believe we'll have a real transition this time. I believe that uh, the Chief of Staff and others will help lead a transition that will put a team in place that is very well aligned with the President's vision and instincts, and will have an incredibly effective second uh, term for President Trump. Uh, what might we see, we see if uh, if there's a President Biden-Harris administration. Well, frankly, if there's a Harris administration, that's a pretty big wild card on foreign policy. Uh, but on Biden, he's had a long track record of being wrong um, on foreign policy. So uh, everything from um, Reagan, he was an alarmist about how Reagan was going to cause World War III and uh, we shouldn't modernize anything. He was opposed to even taking out bin Laden. So the very high priority targets that we should focus on uh, they're opposed to things like taking out uh, uh, Qasem Soleimani. This is the real threat. Take him out. Why would we need to occupy and control terrain to take out some of these threats? So I'm concerned about uh, a Biden administration, but I'm optimistic because, frankly, uh, the, the, the one highlight of the Bernie Biden manifesto might be that on foreign policy, they favor a return to Congress using the war powers. Act. So I think we could go a long way towards using our Constitution. Uh, it is a, 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 a check on executive authority, and therefore it requires the path that engages our nation in fighting and winning our, our wars, rather than just sending our military uh, to, to wage endless wars. So I'm hopeful that if that happens, uh, that'll be the path that, that uh, takes hold in a Biden administration. Um, but, you know, our, our, our future diplomacy can't be characterized by, um, you know, surrender, uh, you know, as, as the consensus. You know, you can, always, you can always stay at peace by just surrendering to whatever somebody else says. And so uh, this, is, uh, this has been shown, whether you're talking about uh, working with allies like NATO and not holding them accountable uh, for their commitments uh, or constructing bad deals like Iran, uh, or footing the bill for others' wars, or even fighting them. That's a pretty long list. So those things can't become the hallmark of American diplomacy. And I have that fear, uh, particularly under uh, a Biden administration, whereas Donald Trump has certainly um, been prescient in confronting our allies, not just for active combat, um, but an effective diplomacy, whether it's with North Korea, uh, with keeping uh, the peace in Israel with defeating ISIS in a very limited way, um, but also holding NATO accountable and linking some of the threats to trade. Uh, lastly, I would say border security is an aspect of national security. You look at transnational criminal organizations, a lot of the insecurity and instability in the United States of America is really funded by hostile organizations uh, that are destabilizing our country. Sanctuary cities are really sanctuaries for cartels, and the president's been great at calling them out. So um, might I suggest four principles for, for us to go forward 
to frame this, and I would say we, we really need to develop an American grand strategy, not just a list of funding priorities uh, that essentially says all of the above, but a real grand strategy. And when you have a strategy that's uh, linked to our national interest, uh, I think this is the vision that the President tried to cast with America First. You can fund the priorities, and if you go back to principles of war, objective, and economy of force, you stay focused with the principle of objective, and you stay restrained with economy of force, and you, you pick your priorities. Uh, we could win with diplomacy where possible. One of my favorite uh, pieces of scripture is Romans 12:18. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And for a long time, the United States uh, did that. It's been a while since we've tried to adhere to that principle, uh, and the neocons, frankly, flip it on its head. If there's a way to get into a war, we'll find it. Uh, and we need to root them out, frankly. Um, and at last, uh, I would say you have to, um, I think the president stated it well, great nations don't fight endless wars. You have to win decisively. And when you can't win decisively, you need to rethink the process and say, uh, let's count the costs. And you can't be indifferent to that. Uh, it, it is inherently linked to the work I'm doing on financial services uh, with sound money. Created the Sound Money Caucus. You can't have sound money if you're bankrupting your country, uh, whether that's for endless wars or, or endless domestic wars like the war on poverty. So. Uh, the priorities really do matter. Uh, our nation, a bankrupt nation, cannot be a secure nation. And so uh, I, I love being with you all, people that get that. And I love the work that the American conservative uh, has made public and shared and shared with our office. And it's an incredible honor to be here with you today to talk about these things. So, you know, as we move forward together, uh, I look forward to uh, the ideas that come out of this, and I'm hopeful that together we can help uh, drain the swamp on the neocon consensus and help cast a true uh, grand strategy based on America First principles. So thanks, and God bless you all.